My topic is going to address a, an issue which one way or another we're all affected by, and that's this issue of faith. Oftentimes people will address faith as though it is some sort of a virus you get or a birthmark you had. I have faith, he doesn't have faith, I have big faith, they have little faith. The truth of the matter is we all live our life by faith. I certainly had a faith experience in my first trip to England in 1983. I got off the plane at Gatwick and uh, I went to the uh, place to change money and I took my hard-earned American greenbacks and they gave me these British pounds. Now, although they look really pretty, they just didn't look like money to me. I recognized that uh, I had something previously in my hand which was uh, backed by the U.S. government, which I felt comfortable with, but certainly this British pound, I wasn't quite sure what that meant to me. I uh, recognized after I took my British pounds out of my pocket and I was able to buy a good British bar of chocolate that it was certainly uh, worth what it said it was, and so I began to use it. Shortly thereafter, of course, I went to Scotland and I had an, a British 20 pound note and I went to a shop there and uh, purchased something and they gave me a Scottish 10 pound note in my change and I thought it was all the same country. And so I took this note, I really didn't know any better and uh, I traveled back down south. When I arrived here in Portsmouth, of course, I walked into a shop in Portsmouth and tried to use my Scottish 10 pound note. Now I had a religious discussion with the lady across the counter because I was trying to convince her that that was legal tender within the British Empire. But because it wasn't on the picture behind her cash register, you've been in those, those small shops where they say, these are, you guys change your money about every 10 years, I guess. But, and so they have the, this is legal tender. And uh, she couldn't see a Scottish 10 pound note. And so we had quite a discussion. And I said, no, it's good money. You can accept it. I accepted it, so you should accept it. <laughs> After all, I traded American dollars for this stuff. And uh, so she was having quite a faith problem. She wouldn't believe the fact that a Scottish 10 pound note was legal tender within England. So we had a discussion back and forth and finally I recognized that in order for us to continue the transaction she needed to accept it. So I asked to speak to her manager. He came out, he recognized, he was uh, worldly wise enough to know that a Scottish 10 pound note was uh, legal tender within England and so I was able to get my bar of chocolate. We of course always have faith experiences. In fact, on the way to the conference center this morning, I had a near death experience. Near, in fact, probably 40 or 50 times I was within six feet of dying. And probably, if you think about it, you did too if you traveled here by car. For the only thing that separates us from the oncoming traffic is this dotted line on the ground. And as I'm traveling in one direction at 60 miles an hour and he's traveling another in the opposite direction at 60 miles an hour, there's only about six feet that separates us. And yet why was I able to carry on and drive down here and act like everything's okay? It's because I have faith that he'll stay on his side of the white line. There's nothing intrinsically protective about a dotted line on a road. I live my life by faith. For years I worked in the aerospace industry and therefore I'm always amazed when I find people so willingly go and fly on airplanes. If you recognize that you were flying in a pressurized vessel seven miles above the earth, if there were to be even one small fracture in that hull, you would all be dead. And that that structure was built and provided by the lowest bidder. <laughs> Not the highest qualified, the lowest bidder built that aircraft. And yet all of us do it. 
millions upon millions of people enter into a faith venture. They live their life by faith. They do so by a simple formula. And it's to that end that I intend to sort of address this afternoon what I call the formula of faith. It's very simple. It is facts plus feelings equals faith. Therefore, the issue of faith is not a battle between facts and faith, but they're a blending together of the two to create a foundation for our expectations. We take a little bit of fact. We recognize that for the most part, People stay on their side of the road and we stay on our side of the road and we're able to travel from one end of the country to the other. We recognize that for the most part, airplanes don't just fall out of the air. We recognize for the most part, when you use legal tender money in a foreign country, that if you get it from a reputable agency, it should be good. And so we place our faith on a feeling, on the facts that we see. During the ministry of Jesus Christ, we see in a number of occasions where he was approached by what I would call supposed seekers. Oftentimes, people would approach Jesus Christ and say, show us a sign. There's an incident in John chapter 6, verse 30, where Jesus, having just finished feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. He was approached by these supposed seekers who said to him, show us a sign that we might see and believe. Now some when they read that passage think, oh, there they go again, being difficult concerning the area of faith. But yet when we look at the disciples of Jesus Christ, We look at the very basis of what Christian faith is all about. No Christian is ever required to take a blind leap of faith into the intellectual abyss. Christian faith is based upon facts, substantiated by how we feel about those facts. Anything else, if facts in the formula of faith are zero, then you do have a blind leap of faith. You have those people who validate their faith by existential experience and expressions, but they have no substance for their faith. It's based solely on feeling and not on any fact. We see within the ministry of Jesus Christ, even his own believers, those who were followers of Christ, did come and ask for signs. John the Baptist, for example, we're told in Luke chapter 7, he's the man, of course, as the forerunner of Jesus Christ, who had that blessed opportunity to introduce Jesus to the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was the one who said, I I baptize in water, but one comes after me who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John knew who Jesus was. Yet later on in his life, when he was in prison, he had a faith crisis. For things perhaps were not coming along the way that he had anticipated them, so he told some of his disciples to go to Jesus Luke records it in chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. He says to his disciples, go and ask Jesus, are you the coming one or should we seek for another? That was a very polite way of saying, look, if you're the Messiah, do the Messiah thing. Come on, where's the throne of David? Sit on the throne of David, ruling the nations with a rod of iron. Come on, I'm in prison here. I'm your cousin. He was in a faith crisis. And so he sent these messengers to Jesus. Now, the response of Jesus was, he said, go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard. He didn't didn't rebuke him. He didn't say, now listen, John, stop being stupid. You need to have more faith. 
I want you to take even a greater blind leap of faith in following me. As John was struggling with his belief, Jesus said, via his disciples, sending them the message, tell them the things that you have seen and the things that you have heard. He says, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. His answer to John is, okay, you need some more facts? I'll give you some more facts. I'll show you some more. He wasn't expecting John to take a blind leap of faith. He was placing before those who were true followers even more evidence. In John chapter 14, one of the disciples by the name of Philip obviously was needing some more facts. He said, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. In other words, we just want to see, we we believe in you, but we just need a little bit more. And Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe in me for the sakes of the works themselves. As Philip, the disciple of Jesus Christ, was struggling, he says, look, I'm not asking you to take a blind leap of faith. Just check the evidence out. I won't necessarily reveal myself nor give evidence for myself in a way that you might request or require. But the evidence is certainly there. Of course, the most famous doubter of the disciples is that man who is remembered as Doubting Thomas. Many people will use that term, oh, he's a Doubting Thomas, not even understanding what I consider to be an unfair assessment of his character. For if you remember, Jesus appeared after his resurrection to his disciples, and Thomas was not there with them. And we're told in the Gospel accounts that They saw and handled Jesus. They wanted to make sure it wasn't just simply an an apparition. It was was real. Well, Thomas wasn't there. So we're told in in John chapter 20, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelves, was not with them when Jesus came. The other's disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. And so Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the prints of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, most people immediately stop there and say, oh, he's a doubting Thomas. From my point of view, he isn't. He's just simply requesting the same information that the other disciples already had. They had seen Jesus. They had touched him. And so all he was doing was saying, I just want the same information you have. Now to further make my point, we see later on in that chapter that as Jesus reappears some eight days later, Thomas is with them. And as Jesus appears, he says, peace be to you. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. What I think is important for us to see that that was a great opportunity for Jesus to rebuke Thomas if he was requiring him to take a blind leap of faith. Come on, somebody has told you about this. That should be all you need. Now I know you're compatriots, the other disciples, they had a different experience than you, but you should just take their word for it. No. What you see Jesus do is Jesus says, okay, Thomas, I'll let you have a personal confrontation with me. I'll reveal enough to you so that you also become a believer. 
When we look at the evidence that is surrounding us in this life that we live, which requires us in so many facets to live by faith, one might ask then, since faith is such an integral part of our life, nobody lives without faith. If you had no faith, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. In fact, you wouldn't lay on the bed. In fact, you'd have no life at all. And so everybody's expressing faith, but the question is, how much facts do you need in order to enable your feelings to produce active faith? What is a reasonable amount of facts? Now, there are a number of legal terms which may be familiar to some of you. There is that evidence which is beyond any doubt. Some people think you need to prove something beyond any doubt. Well, I would put before you this day that there is not one issue in existence today that can be proved beyond any doubt. For there will always be someone, rational or irrational, who will be able to create some kind of doubt even the existence of the person who is speaking to them. They might doubt that you're actually speaking to them. They might be in some sort of a, a existential type of an expression where uh, they, they don't even believe that you're, the physical world exists. And so, in terms of this first definition of facts, that which is established by not having any doubt at all is really too lofty of a goal. It's unachievable. The second is that which is without a shadow of a doubt. Now that's very closely linked, but it does indicate that something needs to be so empirically proved that it is without a shadow of a doubt. But again, that's too lofty of a goal for most of us. If I would have, after landing at Gatwick, walked up to the point of exchange, handed them my U.S. dollars, and they handed me back British notes, if I would have said to them, now, what kind of stuff are you trying to push on me here? What are you doing? Well, that's British currency. How do I know? Well, because I just gave it to you. Well, who are you? You're just somebody behind a glass. This could whole, be, whole thing could be a mirage. And, and you understand, there comes a point where I need to look and I need to make some observation. I need to see this is, this is in, a, uh, in a, uh, a, a reputable place. This is a reputable company. There are certain other people that are exchanging here. Certainly, it's not beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so we come to what is most often the way in which we establish what is a fact. And that is what we would call in legal terms beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt allows for the fact that there may be some areas of that truth which you cannot prove empirically, but the summation of the data is enough for you to be able to establish its truthfulness. Now, one of the bases for establishing what you're going to accept as fact, added with your feelings to produce your faith, is what I call fair-minded judgment. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was approached by Pharisees and Sadducees, and they came testing him, we're told, and they said, show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, you say, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. What Jesus was accusing them of was not being fair with the data. By the time the Pharisees come to him, as recorded in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus had been ministering in Israel for more than two years. By this time, he would have already fed 5,000 men plus women and children, 4,000 men plus women and children. He would have healed, according to the gospel accounts, 
thousands of people would have been touched physically. Various infirmities. The data that this man was extraordinary was readily available to them. But because they had that predisposition to reject him, no amount of evidence was going to be acceptable to them. And so he is saying to them, look, you can discern the sky, you can, you can take some simple data and make an assessment. Why is it you can make that kind of assessment, but you cannot make an assessment concerning the Son of Man? They weren't being fair-minded in their judgment, establishing what is fact and what is fiction. One of the rules within the judicial system is that we need to let the evidence speak freely and not have it be in accordance with a script from the jury. The evidence needs to speak for itself. And that's that fair-mindedness. Now, I must admit, and I'm the first to acknowledge, that there are times within my Christian walk that I doubt some of the claims of Christianity. I readily admit that. When I consider the fact that Christianity teaches that a transcendent, infinite, personal God, existing before time, created everything that exists, seen and unseen, all space, matter, time, and all the laws that govern them, that within the expanse of that universe, God chooses one small planet circling one star of a billion galaxies. Sometimes when I sort of think of that, I think the expanse of the universe, and God chose this one planet circling around a small star in one galaxy, which is one of a billion galaxies. And that within this creation, God made a single creature in his own image, lovingly endowed them with the ability to choose, knowing that through the gift of that choice, mankind would choose to rebel against his creator, leaving him under the ultimate condemnation of eternal separation from his creator. When you consider that, with that knowledge... God predetermined before the foundation of the entire universe that he would send the second person of the Godhead to the end to the very world in which he created, that he would don the veil of human flesh to show man the true character of God and to reconcile man back to God through his death upon a cross. When you simplify the Christian gospel down to sort of those sort of bullet point statements, in and of themselves, I have to admit that sometimes it does sound like a man-centered, man-created theology. And I would be left with that if we did not have any facts upon which we can base our faith. One of the reasons why we began these fellowship of active Christian thinkers was to present facts for our faith. When I consider even simplistically the facts for the claims of Christianity, they're overwhelming. There are, of course, the three classic philosophical arguments for the existence of God. Each one of these arguments we could teach an entire Bible study on, but just to suffice it to say, there are three classic philosophical arguments for the existence of God. There's the cosmological argument for the ex existence of God. That's that argument in the existence of order. When you see order or law, you know there has to be a lawgiver. Now, I had an experience, a cosmological experience myself when I first came to England. I was working at IBM, and uh, some of the guys in, found out that I had played American baseball uh, in the States, 
And uh, so they begin to talk to me about playing cricket. Similar sort of a game. You use a wooden bat and it's a ball and your objective is to score more runs than the other. It all sounded the same to me. I run between three bases. You run back and forth. So they, I took the bait and I went out and uh, really had no training about what was going to happen. Didn't know the rules. Didn't know what silly mid-on means or any of those other silly things that go on with cricket. And of course, when they put me into bat, it made me a little nervous when they covered me with pads to begin with. I, I didn't really understand the rule there, but after my time at bat, they said I did quite well because the term they used to describe my performance was a golden duck. <laughs> and so I figured gold is a good thing. But I didn't understand the rules. Later on, as they began to explain the rules to me, of course, I wanted to have some fun with them. They had fun with me. And so I began to say, now, who said it has to be that? And, and what do you mean if it goes on the ground over the boundary line, it's four, but I have to hit it on a, on a, on a fly, so to speak, to make six? Who made that rule? And they began to say, well, that's just the rules. What do you mean that's the rules? Well, that's the rules. And, of course, where I was leading them is that if there is a law, there has to be a lawgiver. And so that basically is the, a summary of the cosmological ar argument for the existence of God. If there are laws, there has to be a lawgiver. The second is that of the teleological. Don't you love philosophers? They love to use terms that overcomplicate the simple. They're great at that. But the teleological argument for the existence of God is that of design. Now, throughout this conference, of course, we have many experts which are giving us information with regards to design. For many years, I worked as a management consultant within the aerospace industry. Uh, the last 10 years as a program manager, and I can assure you that I have never seen anything ex uh, uh, brought about through accident. Everything that we have done in terms of new technology or new devices has all come as a result of a lot of designers spending a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to bring about that new technology or design. And so the second philosophical argument is that argument of design. The third is what's called the ontological argument for the existence of God. This is one that I love to talk to people about. It's the argument that says, why are we concerned with morality if we are just evolved dirt? Why do we concern ourselves with right and wrong? I love sometimes to make sort of an outlandish statement to get a person's reaction where they say to me, oh, no, that would be wrong, so that I can say to them, who says? Who says? What do you mean wrong? Everyone has a sense of morality. How can morality be something that evolves? How can a morality, no morality, develop a conscience? And so the third philosophical argument for the existence of God is that of why is man concerned with right and wrong? Why doesn't he just get on with life? You know, if you want your neighbor's house, go shoot him. But see, we all react to that, oh, oh, no, that would be wrong. Well, it seems like a pretty efficient way, especially with the way in which you convey houses over here, you know, the, these chains that go on for years on end, and you almost feel like you want to shoot somebody after a while. But of course, it would be wrong. And so there are those philosophical arguments for the existence of God, which have been around for hundreds of years, which still need an answer, which Christianity has an answer for. There is, of course, so much that can be said about the credibility of the Bible. There is that evidence associated with what is called manuscript authority. Manuscript authority is that way in which an archaeologist can establish whether or not an ancient document is credible. Manuscript authority takes a look at two things of an ancient document. First of all, the number of copies 
that are in existence today and the time span from the original autograph or when it was first written to the first copy. And so those two components create what's called manuscript authority. When we take a look just very simplistically at, for example, the writings of Plato. Plato is somebody I'm sure you all read frequently. But Plato is someone who wrote about 400 BC. The earliest copy that we have of Plato's writing is that of 900 AD. So there's approximately 1400 year span there. And of the copies of Plato, we have seven fragments. Now, if you were to say to a librarian, how do I know this document that you've given me was actually written by Plato, they would laugh at you. Well, it's been established. Its manuscript authority is impeccable. You could then take the Iliad of Homer. Homer, again, he wrote it about 900 B.C., and the earliest copy is about 400 A.D. Of the Iliad, we have 643 copies, handwritten copies. Now, that's pretty good authority. The span between the writing and the earliest copies, and again, another 1,400 years, and there's 643 copies for us to compare pretty good. So not many people would credibly be able to say that somehow if you read the Iliad that it was incredible. But what about the New Testament? The New Testament was written from about 40 AD to 100 AD. The earliest copy is about 125 AD. Some have discovered some fragments much earlier than that. Most agree that from the earliest copies to the autograph is about 50 years. And there are more than 24,000 copies of the New Testament. Why do we question the credibility, the authenticity of the Bible, especially the New Testament, when the same rule is applied to all other ancient documents, they pale by comparison, yet how often do you hear people say, oh, the New Testament, you know, it's, it's not real reliable. It's the most reliable document of ancient time that exists, all other pale by comparison. There's so much you can say with regards to not only the credibility of the Bible, but also the reliability of the Bible. Not only do we have a copy of something that is close or identical to the original. But how reliable is the information we have within it? We, of course, will see within some of the presentations in this conference, the very nature of its structure is beyond the ability of human beings to put together. There's elements of the Bible that are so amazing they cannot be there by coincidence, only by design. There is that witness of the Bible of its historical accuracy. One of the things that I love, in fact, Dave Hunt made reference to this, with each new discovery in the archaeological world, what we find is more evidence for the reliability of the Bible, not less. Thanks to the Victorian, the British Victorian uh, explorers in the Middle East, we have a lot of information available to us today, which prior to that period, they thought cities like the city of Babylon and Nineveh, that they were sort of like the city of Atlantis. They were just uh, uh, fictitious places. But of course, during the Victorian era, British explorers went throughout the Middle East and they began to discover these places that and using the Bible as their compass, they begin to find the cities of Babylon and the cities of Nineveh and so on and so forth. Of course, as which has already been pointed out, the Bible ventures into the area of prophecy which no other ancient document, in fact, no religious document at all, 
ventures as deep and as wide into prophecy as the Bible does, places its whole credibility on its ability to speak of tomorrow, yesterday. Prophecies in the Bible, they are astonishing. But the one that I love as the greatest proof for the claims of Christianity was given by Jesus Christ as once again the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 12 and they say, we want to see a sign from you. And Jesus answered and said to them, an even adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When Jesus Christ was finally approached by his greatest protagonist. And they say, show us a sign. We keep asking you, show us a sign. He says, there'll be no other sign given to you than his own resurrection. Yes, when we look at the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, they... they, provide a very solid foundation. Yes, when we look at the credibility of the manuscript authority of the Bible, we see incredible information on the side of the Bible. Yes, when we look at the reliability, both its structure, its historical accuracy, and its prophetic accuracy, yes, those are all solid areas of truth. But when Jesus Christ decided to put his finger on the area that would be the final proof to all mankind, it was his own resurrection. When Dr. Luke, the disciple of Paul, was writing the book of Acts, he begins in chapter 1 by saying, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom. Luke makes a very powerful and even ostentatious statement by saying the facts for the resurrection of Jesus Christ are so great they are infallible. They're infallible. When you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you cannot leave him in the grave. Though historians have attempted many times, you're faced with a real problem. What happened to the body of Jesus Christ? There are those who say, well, the disciples in the emotion of the moment, especially these women, you know the story. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea very hurriedly prepared the body and placed it in the tomb and they went away. On the 17th of Nisan, 32 AD, Sunday morning, the women came very early in the morning to the tomb and You know, some of you men, you understand this when you get that panic call from your wife and she says she's lost the car. They just went to the wrong tomb. And there are those who think, well, they just forgot where the body was. You know, they were were burdened with grief and it was early in the morning and it's not a new thing to have people forget so the, the women just forgot where the body was. And, and so if we went to Jerusalem today and we dug in the right crypt, we would be able to unearth the bones of Jesus Christ. But there's a significant problem with that proposal, and it's simply this. Not only would the women have to have had forgotten, but Joseph of Arimathea, in whose tomb he laid. The guards who guarded the tomb, they would have had to have forgotten it. In fact, everyone in Jerusalem would have had to have forgotten it. Yet there are those who even today say, oh, what happened to the body of Christ was his disciples were just burdened with grief and they forgot. 
There are those who say, well, actually, what happened was Jesus faked his death. It's called the swoon theory. The idea that Jesus was a clever man and he sort of put himself in a deep trance when he was there on the cross and he fooled the Roman guards into believing he was dead. And so when everything quieted down in the cool of the night, he sort of collected himself, rolled the stone away, and ran off. And there's those people that they've written books on this idea of the swoon theory, but just stop for a minute and use common sense and ask yourself this. The gospel accounts validated by Roman practice tell us that when slaves are crucified, rich men were never crucified, only slaves, when slaves are crucified, first of all, they are scourged by the Romans. Many never made it to crucifixion because they would be so brutalized. The gospel accounts, of course, tell us that Jesus was so brutalized that by the time it came time for him to carry his cross to Calvary, he couldn't, and so they had to compel one Simon the Cyrene to come and carry his cross for him, and, and so he walked alongside. Having had the nails pierce his hands and his feet, spending three hours on the cross, he expires. And the Romans, who were experts at killing by crucifixion, they came and they were astonished that he had expired so quickly. So they pierced his side. The Gospels recording that out from his side flowed blood and water. Now, I got to tell you, I have a hard enough time getting up in the morning after working in the garden for three hours. How are you going to survive Roman scourging, crucifixion, pierce in the side? You're going to rise in the tomb at night, roll the stone away, defeat four heavily armed Roman soldiers, and escape. Surely the swoon theory has no credibility. You have those who say, well, what happened was the disciples stole the body. Of course, that was the very first idea that the chief priest put forward as the Roman guards came and told them what had happened. He said, well, the, we'll put together this story that the disciples came and stole the body away, but don't worry, we'll give you some money and we won't execute you. That would be the story of the century. Because these guys had two swords between them. And Peter proved that he couldn't hit anybody's head. He wasn't much good with a sword. And they're going to go take on heavily guarded troops? I don't think so. Why would they fight for a corpse when they wouldn't even stand with him when he was arrested? You even have those that say, well, the idea of the resurrection was a fabrication of the disciples. You know, after all, they had spent three years of their life investing, following this guy, and, you know, after the crucifixion, they probably had a little committee meeting and said, well, look, guys, uh, you know, I've spent all my, I've sold my house and spent all my retirement money on this, and uh, uh, I hate to see this thing just come to nothing. Uh, can't we do something? Can we do something with this thing? And they said, well, let's, let's, concoct a story that uh, he's raised from the dead, you know, we'll all sell books and go on speaking tours and, and uh, it'll be great. Of course, you know the church history concerning all of these guys. They all suffered great persecution. Ten of the eleven remaining disciples of Jesus were executed for their witness to the resurrected Christ. John being the only one who wasn't killed because God, was, because God wasn't done with him yet. He had to write his three epistles in the book of Revelation. The question you have to ask yourself is, why didn't at least one of them say that they had lied? Why go to the grave for a lie? You see, when you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I think you have the greatest fact that has ever existed for the claims of Christianity, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. As you examine that, you can either believe that 
the disciples forgot where the body was, or Jesus faked his death, or the disciples stole the body, or the disciples made it up, or it's a fantastic fact. You see, that's why when Jesus was speaking to these doubters, he said, there'll be no other sign given to you. You want some more proof? That's the greatest proof you, you'll ever need, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. You can't just dismiss it as an unimportant historical event. It's either true and Christianity is true or it's false and Christianity is false. Paul made that very clear before the Corinthian church that if Christ is not risen, then there is no resurrection. You're still in your sins and we are above all men most miserable because there is no hope. It astonishes me within this nation a recent poll that I read last year says that within the largest Protestant denomination within this country, one-third of its ministers do not believe in the resurrection. Well, then they need to read 1 Corinthians where Paul says, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then Christ isn't risen, and if Christ isn't risen, you're still in your sins. So you better just party, man, because this is all there is in the world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest fact. Now, as we see throughout the Bible, we see a number of instances where people, after being given facts, are called now to respond upon those facts. In John chapter 12, verses 35 to 40, Jesus says, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of a light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which is spoken... Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. What an astonishing statement to recognize that one of the important doctrines that we need to understand concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this, that God reveals himself to those who are seekers. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. But if in that searching, you begin to harden your heart so that you will not believe the Bible tells us that he will ultimately harden your heart so you cannot believe. Therefore, he tells these would-be seekers, walk while you have the light. Rightly assess the facts and the data that is before you now. Many of us in this conference will make reference, of course, to Romans chapter 1. But herein, starting in verse 18, we read Paul's warning, really, where he writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Sadly, that can be the end of an individual who closes his eyes to the light that surrounds him. If you refuse to acknowledge the evidence that God provides, he will ultimately remove your ability to even see it. 
John, as he was finishing his gospel, though he tells us in chapter 20 that he could have written many things, verse 30 says, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have eternal life in his name. If you truly say that you are a seeker, then be fair-minded with the evidence. Prejudice has a way of blinding and binding its owners. It blinds them. They do not see, not because they can't see, but they will not see. John says, look, I've written all you need to know. There's much more he could have said. Indeed, I suppose if he would have recorded all the signs and wonders, it would have filled all the libraries in the world, we're told. But he's given us just enough. He's given us just enough within his gospel for us to know that God incarnate dwelt in human flesh, came as a man to not only show us the true characteristics of God, but to become our salvation, to take upon himself the righteous judgment of God upon, uh, that it needs to be upon us. Yet his payment of sin is complete and total. Yes, I believe in giving real seekers facts. Nobody's asked to take a blind leap of faith in the, into the intellectual abyss. But I think if you deal fairly with the facts that are available to you, you, like so many who have gone before you, will fall on your knees and be amazed that one so great, so powerful, would be so loving to love the likes of me and you. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for your word. We're thankful for the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the evidence that it is to our heart of the truth, truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for all the people here in this auditorium this day. Lord, those who are going through a faith crisis, I pray, Lord, that you would further reveal yourself to them. Satisfy their search. Lord, those who are just playing fast and loose, Lord, I pray that you'd convict their heart even now. Lord, may they be aware that without you, they face eternal damnation. But covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, they're offered sonship, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask all of these things. Amen. Thank you very much.